Today, every nation has its own identity, and almost everyone identifies themselves as a citizen of a nation or something comparable. And even though identity is something very personal and individual, there are a few things that make up, represent and strengthen a national identity. The most obvious example of this would be a flag. Naturally, some people won't identify with any flag, but in general I'd argue a majority of people agree that a flag is an integral part of a country or community. However, as you might have guessed by the title of this video, I want to talk about not flags, for once, but about national anthems. To be precise, the different anthems of Germany all throughout history. I initially planned this video to be about post-war Germany only, but since the myth of Stunde Null is nothing but a myth, we will go back just a few years to the Napoleonic Wars. As you might know, the Napoleonic Wars inspired many Germans and spread pan-German nationalism and the desire for a German nation. During the French occupation, many poems and songs were written to celebrate Germany and their people. One example would be This Deutschen Vaterland by Ernst Moritz Arndt, which asks what the German's fatherland is it concludes that every place where German is spoken should be Germany. While the Congress of Vienna established the German Confederation, there still wasn't a unified German nation-state, which disappointed the liberal and patriotic Germans. This again was reflected in the literature and folk songs. Hans Ferdinand Maßmann composed his law for Germany in 1820 and called his song Ich hab mich ergeben, I have surrendered myself. Since there was no internet and the vinyl records would only be invented about 60 years later, those songs spread thanks to male choirs and other associations and unions, with the consequence that they were subject to changes and often didn't even use the same melody. Arndt's song would get the melody we know today only 13 years later, in 1826 by Gustav Reichert. This trend actually persists. Almost every anthem or patriotic song of greater relevance has at least two contributors, one writer and one composer. At the Congress of Vienna, France had to surrender their territories west of the Rhine, which caused tensions between the French government and the German Confederation in 1840. President Adolphe Thiers demanded the natural borders of France, which stirred nationalism in the various German states. One of the most popular songs to arise from the Rhine crisis is Die Wacht am Rhein, The Watch at or on the Rhine, by Max Schneckenburger, with the marsh-like tune from Karl Wilhelm. It describes the brave German soldiers defending their homeland from their enemies, which in most cases were the French. This song actually became the de facto hymn of Germany. It was played at every important event and sung in bars, at birthdays, and probably every time someone paid their friends beer. It was as popular as the royal anthem of Prussia, Heil die im Siegerkranz, which basically was the English anthem God Save the King, dressed up in a Prussian uniform. However popular Schneckenburger's song was, it could never replace the royal anthem, since it didn't mention the von Hohenzollern family. It stayed popular during the Franco-Prussian War and into World War I, and regained that popularity during World War II. On the 26th of August 1841, a certain August Heinrich Hoffmann von Fallersleben was on vacation in England, on Helgoland to be precise. Yes, that island belongs to Germany now, but back then it belonged to the British crown because of inheritance. Anyway, August stood on the cliffs, looking into the distance, watching the sun sink into the North Sea, and he felt poetic. He had to write his feelings down and so he wrote a love letter to Germany. His desire for a modern and free German state. No, one German nation. He created the Lied der Deutschen or Deutschlandlied, the song of the Germans. In contrast to many other songs from this time, Hoffmann knew exactly what melody should accompany his text. He picked Josef Haydn's melody of the Austrian imperial anthem, which itself was a variation of a Croatian folk song, Hoffmann had multiple reasons to pick this specific tune. Of course, it sounded just beautiful. 
But more importantly, it was already very popular. Everyone could join in singing it with simply the text, which greatly helped spreading the song, even into the southern states. History, however, would ignore Hoffmann's wishes as the revolution of 1848 failed and Otto von Bismarck took it into his own hands to unite Germany. With Bismarck being a staunch monarchist, the Prussian royal anthem became the anthem of Germany, even though it wasn't all that popular in the south. Around the turn of the century, the German Empire had Wilhelm II as its emperor. Due to his lack of popularity and the changing times away from praising royalty as gods, the song of the Germans gained popularity. This unfortunately led to it being sung during assaults in the Great War, which created the Langemark myth. Due to this myth, especially the first stanza became heavily associated with militarism and nationalism. The German Revolution put an end to the monarchy and thus needed a new anthem. Around 2,400 suggestions were collected by the Prussian Ministry for Culture, but the issue was sidelined. Understandably, after a few years and debates, President Frederick Ebert of the SPD officially decided the Songs of the Germans to be the anthem of Germany on the 10th of August 1922, just in time for the Verwassenstag Constitution Day on the 11th. He argued that no other song could unite the Germans and believed the values of unity, justice and freedom to be what the government should have at its core values. While the third verse was sung on the celebrations on the 11th, the entire song was the anthem which frustrated many on the left. If everything goes according to plan, this video was published exactly 100 years after this historical event. This of course changed when the National Socialists came to power in 1933. As much as they hated the black, red and golden tricolours, they hated the third verse of the Deutschland Lied. While unity was something they fetishized, freedom and justice didn't fit their new state. So they usually only sang the very first verse, using and increasing its nationalistic character. In order to cement their new government with all its benefits, like the SA and SS, they unofficially added the Horse Vessel Lied to their anthem. So, after 1933, the Germans sang about how Germany stood above all and how the SA marched and fights together. While anthems can give millions something to identify with, they won't make them win a world war and when the Allies eventually occupied Germany, they made all Nazi and nationalistic symbols illegal. Now we are entering the part of the video I initially planned to make. In 1949, Germany was rebranded and released onto the world stage. Twice. Let's first discuss the German Democratic Republic. The socialist government of the GDR wished a clear distinction between its future and the horrendous past. They had a new national anthem created by Johannes Robert Becher, which he called Auferstanden aus Ruinen. The anthem mentions the rubbles left by the past, but peers into the hopeful future of a united Germany. Interestingly enough, it doesn't really mention socialism, communism or any great revolution. Of course, there are a few lines about equality and work, but it can't be compared to the Soviet anthem. By 1972, the SED faced the fact that there were two German nations, so the anthem wasn't representative of the government's attitude and thus could no longer be sung. From then on, until January of 1990, the anthem of the workers and peasants state was only instrumental. Moving west to the Federal Republic of Germany, things are much more complicated. Their constitution, the Grundgesetz, set the black, red and golden tricolor as national flag, but failed to determine an anthem. So when it was proclaimed, the politicians used Marsmann's song Ich hab mich ergeben from earlier as a stand-in anthem, 
which was really funny, considering they had only surrendered just four years earlier. This was also recognized by the Germans themselves, who often felt silly singing they had surrendered and wanted another song as their anthem. The anthem issue became more pressing when Germany took part in sport events, such as football matches. Depending on where the football match was set, their substituted anthems varied and were often simply a carnival song or a schlager, one of Germany's worst song genres. In the Rhineland region, for example, they sang the Tritonesian song, which literally is about the partition of Germany, nonsense and culture. It is a fun song, but totally unfit for an official anthem. While Western Germany struggled with the anthem, the small and newly independent Saarland had their things sorted out. When they played in sports, they simply played the Saarlied. I didn't know this existed either before making this video. You're welcome. Since the issue of the anthem hasn't been resolved, some politicians and even regular people took it into their own hands. Many sent their suggestions to the federal government, where they apparently are still stored. Most of them are simply variations of the Deutschlandlied. The federal president Theodor Heuss even went as far as creating an entirely new anthem together with Protestant church hymn writer Rudolf Alexander Schröder and composer Hermann Reuter. They called their song Hymne an Deutschland. It was first premiered on New Year's Eve of 1950, after Heuss held a speech. After its introduction to the world, the potential future anthem was played every night on the Nordwestdeutscher Rundfunk, after broadcasting had ended. You might think that this advertisement would give it an advantage, but polls made in 1951 showed that 40% of Germans didn't know the song, 29 didn't want it as anthem, and 23 didn't care, and merely 8% of Germans wanted it to be their new anthem. These numbers look even worse when compared to a poll about the Deutschlandlied. It's safe to say that Theodor Heuss and his accomplices had failed to create a nationwide accepted anthem. The Germans didn't like Theos Nachtlied, as they mockingly called it, because it was too Protestant and too religious for their taste. Chancellor Konrad Adenauer added that a national anthem had to grow naturally over time and couldn't simply be created for the sake of it. Interestingly, during the Olympic Games, Germany only had one team until 1968, so both German states had a common team which needed an anthem too. Since using either national anthem would have been impossible, they used Beethoven's Ode an die Freude, which is currently the European Union's anthem. After 1968, each Germany had their own team respectively and used their national anthems. Since Heuss' attempt failed, the only song that could realistically become West Germany's national anthem was the Deutschlandlied. Adenauer and Heuss officially appointed the entire song as anthem with just a few letters. They discussed that the third stanza was most fitting for Germany, but they never established that the first two would not be part of the anthem. There was no grand ceremony or big announcement. Its first official use was on the 1st of March 1952. On this day, the United Kingdom returned Helgoland to the German Republic. The decision to technically use the same song as the Weimar Republic in Nazi Germany had different reactions from the Germans and nations around the world. Austria, for example, protested Germany using the Haydn tune in 1947 because they feared that it would be seen as German and not Austrian. From then on, both German states had an anthem and it was all good. Well, except for the multiple times the first stanza was sung, which most often was an accident or out of habit. Like after Germany won the World Cup in 1954 and the Germans themselves made this mistake. Den Kapitän der deutschen Weltmeistermannschaft ist auch deren Spuschkasch nach vorne gegangen, hat die Gratulation angenommen und Deutschlands Hymne erklingt. In 1988, some legal scholars actually argued that Germany did in fact not have an anthem, because there had never been any law explicitly establishing any song as anthem. 
This is probably one of the most German things ever. The court however ruled that the correspondence between Heuss and Adenauer was sufficient enough for the anthem. During the end of the Cold War and especially around 1989, the Deutschlandlied was very popular in the GDR, since the East Germans wanted unity, justice and freedom above all. A protest in the GDR ending in the destruction of the Berlin Wall marked the end of this nation and symbolically the end of communism in Eastern Europe. With the German reunification on the 3rd of October, many initiatives were started to establish a new anthem. One candidate for this was the Kinderhymne, the children's anthem by Bertolt Brecht, which was made in 1950 in direct opposition to the Deutschlandlied. Another suggestion was from Lothar de Maizière, the Prime Minister of the GDR at the time. He wanted to combine the GDR anthem with the third stanza of the Deutschlandlied. This idea seems kinda hilarious to me, but I guess it kinda makes sense. After all, both songs have reasonable lyrics and would be fit as anthems. He also had ideas on how the United Germany could be called. He suggested Deutsche Bundesrepublik and Bund Deutscher Länder. In the end, all of his ideas weren't popular with his colleagues and after having to face dealings with the Stasi he made, de Maizière withdrew from politics altogether. Germany was now reunited with both the name and anthem of the Federal Republic. Chancellor Kohl and President Weizensecker, just like Adenauer and Heuss did almost 40 years earlier, wrote each other letters discussing the anthem. They officially declared only the third verse to be the national anthem of the German people in 1991. After the reunification, the motto of unity, justice and freedom were more fitting than they have ever been. Germany didn't have to literally be unified, like before, but the German people had to be unified. After all, two societies had to become and function as only one. This however didn't end all discussions about the Deutschlandlied. When the World Cup was held in 2006, there was a discussion about the Singpflicht for the football team since some rather conservative politicians thought the German team wasn't patriotic enough and lost because of their lack of love for their nation. This of course is completely unreasonable and has no scientific backing. Other times rather left-leaning individuals and parties like Die Grüne have criticized the anthem because of its troubled past and suggested the Kinderhymne as replacement, which still had no success. The latest noteworthy discussion about our national anthem is from 2018. Christine Rose Möhring from the Social Democratic Party was Equal Opportunities Officer, Gleichstellungsbeauftragte, and wanted to make the anthem less focused on men and therefore more accessible for everyone. When the original spoke of brotherly and fatherland, she wanted it to be courageous and homeland. This sparked discussions and reactions ranging from approval to predictions of the end of white men. I personally think it sounds worse than before and should not be really adopted. It's not a pressing issue, so I don't really care. Her proposal for a gender fair anthem was rejected, since the anthem was seen to be a historic document which couldn't or shouldn't be altered. Write your opinions on this gender fair anthems in the comments, I am delighted to read them, please stay civil. Yeah, and that's where we are today. Einigkeit und Recht und Freiheit für das deutsche Vaterland. Thank you for watching the entire video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like and write a nice comment. If you didn't, write a comment and tell me what I could do better next time. Also big thanks to Embrace Historia for lending me his voice. Please check out his channel. He makes quite interesting videos about England and Wales. Now that I am done, have a great day and I will see you next time.